Let's go ahead and begin the House Education Administration Committee. Welcome, everyone, committee. Appreciate you being here as well as the audience. Uh, we have a calendar today, uh, which we get into in a, in a moment, of about uh, where we have 13 uh, pieces of legislation that's come out of K through 12. But let's start. Let's have the clerk call the roll. Representatives Baum, Bolso, Butler, Sapicki, Fritz, Gant, Gillespie, Haston, Hurt, Lafferty, Love, McKenzie, Parkinson, Reagan, Ritchie, Stevens, Warner, Vice Chairman Slater, Chairman White. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Before we uh, get into any recognitions from, from the announcements, let's have uh, let's have our opening prayer. We always like to open our community with a prayer for ask for wisdom as we make decisions that that uh, affect the uh, children of our state. I'm going to call on Representative Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you choose to, please bow your head and pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and thank you for the opportunity to be here, dear Lord. I pray first that you would watch over the schools across our state and across our country, dear Lord, and, and help those there to make the decisions they should make and, and please keep them safe. Please be with each and every member of this committee, dear Lord, as we make decisions that affect those students. Please help us to have your wisdom and your guidance. And also, dear Lord, please be with everybody in this room as they as they travel here today and as they leave and, and head home to their families. Please be, please be with them and bless them. Again, we thank you for all the opportunities, dear Lord. Forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I've gotten to serve with Representative Hurt. How many years now? I mean, six. six years. And I can honestly say one of the finest members up here. West Tennessee is served well. Thank you. Okay, we're slow and recognize for welcoming or anybody has any represent Butler. You're right. Thank you, Reverend? Chairman. I want to recognize uh, I've got Morgan County uh, leadership group here. I want to ask y'all to stand, but I want to make them feel welcome. Of course, they're from District 41, one of the greatest districts in the state, and just want to recognize them for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Chairman Sapicki. Thank you, members. Uh, J.C. Bowman with Professional Educators has a shadow today. It is Joy Hardison. She's a senior at Stewart County High School. She's going to go to MTSU to major in education and wants to be a second or third grade teacher. Can you stand oh, up wow. real quick? Thank you. Stand up real quick. We need to put you in the classroom now. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad it's a great career. Uh, let's go Chairman Reagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And also from Stewart County High School, my shadow today, Charles Cherry is here. Let's make him feel welcome. Uh, Representative Love. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have uh, two people here. One, Mr. Dwight Beard, who is the president of the Nashville chapter of the Tennessee State University Alumni Association. Also, Ms. Diane Eaton, if they'll please stand. And we, have, we are honored by the presence of Representative Parkinson. You are recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I've, I've been asking everyone to be on their best behavior today. And uh, because my assistant who runs my district office is here for the first time. Her name is Nichelle Smith. Nichelle, if you'll stand. <laughs> and and, and thank, thank you to the committee, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Chair, so far, everybody's been doing well up until... Just about now, Mr. Chair. So we're going to be nice today. Well, what we're going to do is have uh, Reverend Hurt pray again for Michelle. <laughs> Anyone else like to be recognized? Uh, uh, and Reverend Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like to uh, recognize my shadow for the day, Benjamin Gillette from Bell Buckle, Tennessee. I love Bell Balkos, a great little community south of here. As a, there's a great restaurant you have right in the middle of town I, I enjoy, right on the railroad tracks there. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Recognition? Okay, let's jump. We'll jump on the calendar. First of all, let me just mention in the, the chairs of these subcommittees, we have two subcommittees, K through 12 and higher ed, that flow into the uh, full committee. And the chairmen ha have announced that uh, Monday is the final calendar. I believe that's correct. Correct me if I'm wrong. And that your any bills that want to get in that had to be put on notice by 3.30 today, correct? Right? 
just want to make sure everyone is, is aware of that. So if you want to get in the, heard in the education committee this year. Let's jump right into House Bill 1861 by Leader Faison. You, you have a motion in a second. I see you do have an amendment that rewrites the bill. Members, uh, can we go ahead and add that amendment so we have proper discussion? You got a motion second on the amendment. It is 13438. Without objection, all those in favor adding the amendment, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. You have a bill amended properly. Leader face on you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, committee. Very good to be with y'all. Back in 2013, the legislature, which is a few of us were there then. I see this gentleman from Shelby County was with us then. <clears throat> we passed a bill that would allow homeschoolers to be able to compete and athletics of your local high school that were under TSSAA or TMSAA. And one thing we missed, though, there are some sports that do take place at your local high school that are not part of the TSSAA or TMSSA, such as bowling or swimming. And so this bill would make it where homeschoolers can play in those sports, whether or not they were TSSAA recognized or not. And that's how it does. Okay, members. With that explanation from Leader Faison, anybody have a question of you? The question has been called. Any objection to the question? Here, none. All those in favor of House Bill 1861 moving out the calendar rules and the keep saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Leader. Item number two by uh, Leader Cochran. Is he in here in the room? Okay, we'll roll him a why don't we roll him two spaces and come back to uh, House Bill 2480. Let's go on to item number three, House Bill 2472 by Representative Raper. You're recognized. You have a motion and second on your bill. What, what amendment are we looking at? 015318. 015318 does rewrite the bill. Are we looking at 015330? Is that off? It also says, that, re, sir? Uh, just uh, 318. 318. Okay. Yes, sir. It does say it rewrites the bill. You got a motion. Do I have a second? Okay. Without objection, let's add this to the bill for proper discussion. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Okay. 15318 is now on House Bill 2472. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to say I've been working uh, diligently on this bill, and we got uh, a lot of the uh, wording from Williamson County School System. Uh, PED has been working with me and, and some others. And this bill establishes a set of guidelines that shall take place if a student physically assaults a school employee. We have several school employees assaulted each year, which results in fear of returning to work. Many times they end up leaving the profession altogether. Uh, a student should be suspended for the school uh, from the school where they are enrolled for the period of time specified by the principal, uh, principal teacher or assistant principal. And this, uh, this suspension would be um, uh, at a zero tolerance policy, uh, the a suspension for a year, unless um, uh, the guidelines of um, of special ed intervene, and then uh, that would take precedent over that. And uh, and it, this can be also modified by uh, the director of schools, which all zero tolerance offenses can. And um, next thing is. Each LEA or public charter school must advise the assaulted employee of their rights as a result of the, the assault. This includes, but is not limited to, an employee's rights to file a report with the appropriate law enforcement agency and judicial authorities, and they should also support the employee in prosecuting the student who committed the assault. If a student is, is suspended for committing an assault against an employee, uh, that attends and they attend a special event because they're also banned from school sponsored events, uh, then they, uh, they shall be charged with trespassing. Ultimately, and this is my final thing, is no school employee should ever be in fear of going to work. I, I renew my motion. 
Thank you. Rebs and Rape has laid it out for us. We have a couple of, uh, that want to ask questions. Rebs and McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I do have several questions, but but prior to, to that, I know I'm out of order. I like to represent, I, I like to recognize um, the folks here for our Divine Nine Day on the Hill. We have members from the Phi Beta Sigma fraternity. Uh, they would stand from uh, Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. I know there's at least one lady from Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority, and then the, the, the Omega Psi Phi fraternity incorporated. They stand under the leadership of our district director, district representative, Brother Quincy Snyder. So let's recognize them. Yeah, thank you. I was, I was getting asked if you wanted to recognize all the purple jacket. Yeah, did, did you, you I figured you was part yeah, of it. Right. You noticed that. Okay, thank do you have a... Yes, I, I do. I have, I have se several. Um, so uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. To, to the sponsor, sh shouldn't we be focusing our time and attention on preventing assaults as, as opposed to being reactive in this way um, uh, to, to, to these kind of events? You know, kind of increase uh, teacher support by adding more mental uh, behavioral specialists in our in our school system as, as opposed to, to, to kind of uh, dealing with it on the back end? Rev. Rev. Raper. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, I agree we, we do need to do that, but uh, also uh, we have a shortage of teachers and this uh, can uh, help take the place of this because uh, we just do not need uh, an assaulted teacher or uh, another uh, employee of the school system uh, that is scared to uh, return to work. So that's uh, why that uh, uh, we put such a, um, uh, a emphasis on this bill. Uh, yes, sir. Representative McKenzie. Thank you. I, I agree with what you said. I mean, it, it, we should be preventing assaults. I just don't think this, this bill does that. It reacts to assaults. But my, my uh, second question is, you know, I'm, there's, a, there's a law in the books. I could quote it. But that already says that aggravated assault is a zero to uh, tolerance policy. So, and, and it's, it's already there and the suspensions uh, uh, are there. So two, two questions to you, what does this bill do differently? And what is the definition of assist? Representative Raper. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the first part and then I'm gonna ask you to repeat the second part. Okay. Um, what does this do? It mainly empowers uh, the LEA and the the assaulted employee uh, of. Uh, First of all, the LEA has to advise them of their rights. They, they also have to help them uh, overcome this, whether it would be uh, with a counselor or a psychiatrist or something like that. The next thing is, is help them with the prosecuting uh, of the student and uh, just advise them completely of the rights. Now, the second part, would you mind repeating that again? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say that. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Allow me some latitude there. And th th this will be my final question to you. So um, it says that, that the LEA are public charter schools um, to support and assist an employee who's assaulted by a student and prosecuting the student who committed the assault and encourage the prosecuting attorney, attorney to request the uh, court prohibit the uh, defendant from attending school sponsored events. So my uh, question is, you know, how far does that assist go? I mean, is it, assist is a big word. It could be financially assist. So are we, are we gonna ask our schools to help out financially? If there's time off, we're gonna try to help our, our, our the, the assaulted teacher uh, with, with any kind of mental health um, uh, requirements that, that he or she may have. I'm just, uh, when you say assist, that's kind of an open-ended word. So I don't know uh, what that word assist means totally. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Raper. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Kinsey, Re Representative Raper. Very good question. And uh, I, I wanted to say this is uh, it, it's mainly non-financial. It, it's more of verbiage and um, guidelines to help assist them uh, as far as the smooth transition back to the classroom and uh, where they're in a, a comfortable situation. 
Thank you. I do have one question before I go to uh, Representative Warner. Uh, I see the bill does in your amendment does define what assault is in the 39-13-101. Is there anything, and I'm, I'm agreeing with no teacher should be assaulted. As a former school teacher, I, I totally agree with that. But if a student is suspended for a year, is there any recourse when they come back in the following year? I mean, this is a child that's already got issues. They've been out of school. Are they in a virtual school this year? What is what is that? The reps in. Yeah. Uh, thank you. you a very good question, also. And um, uh, no uh, other other than uh, the if the student sees assistance, it would be like any other situation in the school system where we need to uh, use every. Uh, means possible to try to assist a student. So if a student has committed an act like that, then we need to uh, look at all our resources, counselors, whatever it takes to try to uh, smooth the transition for them back into the school system where they are also at ease. So, Thank you. I'm going to go to uh, Representative Warner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and and you touched on my concern there a little bit, and and thank you for that. But I'm going to ask in a different way, I guess. And, and thank you, Representative, for the bill. I think it's a good bill. I think it's a bill that's needed. My question to you: When these kids are expelled or when they're sent home, will they have the availability to uh, uh, for virtual learning? Uh, that's correct. You reckon um, it, from from my knowledge uh, as an educator, we really have two choices. Um, we can send them to an alternative placement or um, we can also uh, do virtual, uh, either or, and whichever one uh, that uh, the director of school sees fit in that. Follow up. And, and, and this bill allows either, either or one. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Representative Bolso. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also thank you, uh, sponsor, for, for the bill. One thing that uh, I was just interested in understanding is that, I mean, the bill obviously allows a principal, a principal teacher or an assistant principal to uh, suspend a student who commits an assault, uh, which is defined in, in Title 39. But does the underlying statute specify how a principal is to go about deciding whether an assault has occurred? That is not, and and uh, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, I want to be. You're recognized. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, it it does not, and and that would be no different than any other situation that uh, uh, whether it's an assault on another student, a fight, uh, uh, any other thing like that. That's uh, the uh, the the final decision goes with uh, whoever's head of that school. That's why we listed other than just principal, you know, whoever's in charge at that moment that can make that kind of decision. So nothing would be different as far as that's concerned. We would just follow, follow the guidelines that are uh, set forth. And also I want to mention this, Mr. Bussell, as uh, um, uh, Representative Bussell, thank you for, uh, I did uh, uh, enter an amendment as far as the assault's concerned. You brought that up as a concern, so I, I wanted to make sure that uh, that was in there, but thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sponsor. Representative Love. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the sponsor. Uh, just two questions. A few years back, we passed legislation that required the school district, and I think the school also, to take into account the adverse childhood experiences that a student might have experienced or had in their life when they considered the, the um, possible suspension or expulsion of a student, how does this particular bill interact with, with that bill that we passed that was made law a few years ago? Ribs and Raver? I'm, I'm not giving you this uh, from my knowledge of the bill. I'm giving you my knowledge as an educator. Uh, what happens is this, is when you get to a point where you see uh, a situation merit where you think that the, the guidelines of the zero tolerance offense should be changed, 
then that goes to the discretion of the director of schools and they say, I'm going to waive a part of this. I'm going to uh, waive all of it. I'm going to uh, uh, do one semester, uh, whatever they may choose at that point. So it will come down uh, to the final decision to that director of schools. Follow up. Thank you. And the second question is this. I read in the legislation where it says that a student who is suspended for committing the assault is prohibited from attending school-sponsored events. Does that include graduation for other classmates that they may have or those ahead of them or basketball or football games where they may purchase a ticket as a, as a citizen of the county or state in which they live and not as a student? President Raper. Yes, sir, it does. Uh, in my case, so uh, you mentioned graduation, and a great deal of time they find an alternative because they know that's sort of the the lot the the culminating uh, part of uh, you being in school. So uh, that a lot of times will be adjusted. Uh, sometimes it, it will be uh, a, an alternative graduation. Sometimes uh, they'll allow them just for that one day. But uh, as far as the sporting events, uh, a drama, uh, anything like that, yes, sir, it, it does apply to that. Follow up. Thank you. This final question. What about instances where it's not their graduation, but let, let's say that it's, yeah, it's, it's a relative or a friend who is graduating. Maybe they're a class ahead of them. And unfortunately, the student may have committed this particular act that caused them to be suspended, but they have a family member that's graduating within that time frame. Are they still prohibited from attending e even that school-sponsored event? Representative Raper, I'm going to give you my best answer. I don't know that one. Uh, Representative Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move previous question. Okay, prevocation has been called. We've had a motion to second. I don't see any objections. So uh, without objections, uh, members, all those in favor of moving House Bill 2472 out of calendar rules, any capable saying aye? Aye. Opposed? The eyes have it. It does move out. Thank you, Chair and Committee. Thank you. Let's go to item number four, House Bill 2758 by Representative Alexander. You are recognized. You have a motion and a second. Are we dealing with an amendment that you need to add? I think it would be 012824. How about... You have a 14734? Oh, yes, I do. I'm sorry. 014734. Okay, I see it doesn't write the bill. Does it just add on to? It does. It just adds on uh, to it. And you Chairman speaking. Could okay. you give us an explanation before we we uh, okay. work on the bill? Of, of the bill or of the amendment, sir? The, the amendment. Okay. The amendment, the only thing that does is I had some special needs uh, students in my office right before I got ready to uh, um, present this bill to you all uh, last week. And what what that amendment did was allow them, they have a, a technology assisted devices, which will speaks to you like through a computer and they want to be able to use those and I want them to be able to use those. And um, my superintendents and everything that brought me the bill loved adding that in. So that's what the amendment's for. We have a motion and second to adopt the amendment. Any objection? Seeing none. Okay, we're on House Amendment 14734. All those in favor, add it to House Bill 2758. Indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the bill's properly amended. Now go ahead and explain your bill. Okay. What the bill does is it requires each local uh, education agency, LEA, and public charter school to develop and adopt a policy that prohibits students from displaying, using, or accessing electronic devices during instructional time unless the electronic device is authorized or provided uh, uh, to the student by the LEA or the public charter school for instructional purposes. This bill came to me from, for my super, from my superintendents and principals in my area. Okay, the first hand up was Representative Warner. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, sponsor, for bringing the bill. Uh, say we had a child with a learning disorder and they wanted to turn on their cell phone to record uh, the lesson. Would that be prohibited, prohibited um, under this bill? Representative Alexander? If they have a learning disorder, then they also have an IEP. And so they can, um, they will be able to, based on uh, that school system deciding that they can use that. Follow up. Well, let me rephrase that question again. If they have a learning disorder or if they if it helps them to learn without having an IEP and they need to, it, they can go back at night and check and see what the lesson, what was, what was talked about that day. Would it prohibit that child that does not have an IEP from recording the lesson that was going on? Resident? Yes, yes, it would, unless um, the school system recognized this child's need for that and decided to allow that child to do that. Follow well, and one last follow. What about if we had a we had some bad bad actors uh, teaching prohibited concepts in this great state of Tennessee? Would this prohibit students from recording those teachers doing those bad habits? You're recognized. If they did not have their electronic device on them, it would prohibit them from recording it, I would think, sir. Thank, thank you. Let's go to uh, Chairman Baum. Thank you, Chairman White. I, I have found that when I'm in a classroom or I guess another environment and I see people on their cell phones, I kind of wish there was a rule that prohibited cell phones. But then when I need to get in touch with somebody, I kind of like being able to use one. I kind of like it when they respond. Uh, I've got three kids. Two have graduated from public schools, high school. I've got a senior, my third. And from time to time, I send a text and need a, need a response. I'm missing my keys. I wonder if he's taking them to school with him or maybe I'm picking him up from school early and I text him to say I'm in the main office. I guess my question is, I just wonder if this is a little heavy-handed to mandate this at the state level when we really could allow our LEAs to address this individually using a policy that maybe fits their needs. Representative Alexander. The superintendents in my area felt like it would be really nice to have a policy at the state level where all school systems were doing the same thing. I have uh, had teachers that go to my church, like yourself that teach on the college level, who said, hey, I love that cell phone bill. Sure wish we could get it at the college level because I had a kid watching a movie while I was trying to teach. Um, I don't know about you all, but my cell phone laying on my desk up here constantly lights up when things are going on. And it's a constant distraction for students. Um, by doing this bill at the state level and by giving the authority to these, these school boards they have the ability to make their own choices on how they want that policy to go. I guess, I guess my follow-up question would be, have you talked to other LEAs outside of your own to see if how they would structure their policies and if those variations would be allowed within the parameters of your bill? Representative Alexander? Yes, I have. I have, and I've also talked to the head, I believe it's TOSS, Am I saying that right? Correct. Uh, yes. I've talked to them. They're directors. They've been in my office. We talked about the bill. Yes. Representative McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, couple of questions. So first, this bill does not prohibit a student from having a cell phone or his or her person. So they can have it in their pocket but it must be off. Is that what this bill would do? Representative? The LEA or charter school would make that decision. Some schools might choose for the students not to have their cell phone all day long. Other schools might choose that they can get it back in between classes. Um, some schools are, are choosing to purchase devices so that the cell phones can be stored in them. Other school systems are allowing the teachers just to gather them in the back of the room. So it just depends on the LEA's choice. Follow up. Thank you, sir. And that, I, I, I guess I, I don't see that specificity on in the bill in terms of giving them the latitude. It, I mean, if I'm reading the language of the bill, it just says that uh, basically 
they can't display it. That, that's the harshest term. They can't have it on and be using it, but they can't display it. So long as it's hidden from display, I, I, I would hate for us to end up in a, um, or, or LEA to end up in a situation where they take a, put it in a bag and keep it in the back of the room. And that's not, that's not the law as written. Uh, so that, that, that bit concerns me a little bit, but my, um, um, second, I guess, and important question is what's the penalty, uh, when a student, uh, is found with a phone on, on his, his or her person. Recognize representative. Okay. To answer your first question, um, representative is in section, uh, C, and it says each local board of education and public charter school body shall develop and adopt a policy to effectuate this section prior to that. Okay. Then to answer your question uh, where you said, what is the uh, punishment? Uh, it would, that, that, sir, is up to the school boards and, and the, the LEAs of, or school boards of the charter schools. Can I find them? Okay, you recognize follow up. Uh, uh, the final question. You're right, and see, it talks about they can do whatever the policy says, but everything above it, again, doesn't talk about um, having the per the phone on the person. And, you know, and I guess the 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 uh, last piece is that's kind of unsettling too. You know, in that we're not consistent. We won't be consistent in what we're doing across LEAs. If a student transfers from a uh, a city school to a county school or parents, you know, have a good feel for what the cell phone policy is. I, I'm sure that's not going to be something that's going to be covered. Okay, well, you came from here and it's, they take it from you for a day and you go to the next school and you're suspended for three days or in, or in school suspension. That, that, that's, um, that given that ability and not being consistent in what, what we want as, as a state government them to have, that and I, I tend to agree with the previous person in that each LEA probably needs to deal with this on their own. So thank you. President Alexander. Well, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Can I ask a question while you're getting your train of thought back? Basically, your bill, because I go. Uh, oh, I know what go, my train of ahead, thought can I, can go, I, go ahead. Can I go with it before I lose it again? Was that the whole purpose of this bill is just to say, we would like school boards to set a policy to not allow cell phones during instructional time. That's all this bill does. And the school boards have the freedom to do with it how they want to do it. But we're just suggesting a cell phone is distractive for educational purposes. And you read my mind. That's what I was getting ready to tell you to say. So thank you. Let's go to uh, uh, Representative Love. Thank you, Ms. Chairman. To the sponsor, just want to make sure I'm clear about what you said earlier. You've spoken to every superintendent in the state about this bill. I have not spoken to every superintendent across the state. I have spoken to several superintendents across the state, one in Davidson County, um, or it might have been Shelby County, different some different counties. And then I spoke with uh, the head of TOS, who heads up all the superintendents and gets their feedback and talk to them. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. That would be Dr. Lilly. So my, my concern is that, and I appreciate you reaching out to talk. my concern would be that a bill of this magnitude that, that does have these implications uh, might need to go beyond the surface of just toss and, and doing a conversation with each superintendent, if you have time, because we're creating a state law that's requiring school districts to put a policy in place that either they may already have or that they may be trying to figure out how to do. Uh, so my question would be this. What is the penalty for LEAs if they say our policy is going to be that kids can't have it? Is there some possible repercussions from the state level with this law to those LEAs? Representative Alexander. This bill does not address any kind of penalty to the LEA. Follow up. Thank you. And, and, and so as, as you can best inform us, 
would it be your legislative intent then that if an LEA has a relaxed policy that we don't come back and supersede that one? That would be you recognize that would be up to the general assembly. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Parkinson, you have a question? I did, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, and to to my colleague, uh, you know, these cell phones bring accountability. You know, um, in the classrooms, um, sometimes it's not as savory as we want it to be. You know, but you know, in situations where you know there are things that are that are going awry. You know, these students will whip these cell phones out in a heartbeat and start capturing, you know, the moments. Um, um, in, in, in situations where, where there are school shootings, these cell phones and, and these parents want access, I mean, these students and these, these parents want access to each other. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned and I get it. I understand, you know, the, the, the reason why the bill is being brought. I promise you I get that. But but we live in a different day. You know, we live in a day where, you know, these cell phones may be the the lifeline uh to communication that would possibly save a student's life. And so and I'm I'm so I have a, a little concern about the bill and and because you know because we live in this uh, a day where where people walk into school buildings and shoot the buildings up and shoot the kids and shoot the teachers and all of them, and and you know, if, if I know, thank God, my my daughter's graduated this year, last year, thank God, because I, I'm I'm concerned about how you know the policies and the steps we're taking to you know keep our children safe, and I think this will remove um, a possible um, item of safety that a child may have in in being able to communicate with who they need to communicate in in case of you know, these uh, tragic events. So uh, I'm, 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 I get where you come from, but I'm gonna have to be a no on the bill and I'm sorry for that. Thank you. There's more of a comment. If you can respond if you want to, if not, I go to the next. Okay, uh, Chairman Sapicki. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I just wanna clarify here. Yes, In sir. the bill, a student would be allowed to have a cell phone with them electronic device for the entire day of school. But what your bill says in section two is during instructional time, and that's defined any period of time during school day that is designated for academic instruction, including classroom sessions, examinations, and other educational activities, is your intent in the bill is at that time during instructional time would be the only time that the LEA would use this bill to prohibit those cell phones from being accessed during classroom instruction time. Is that correct? You are correct. So, a, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. You're, you're, you're recognized. So a child a student could come to school with their cell phone, hanging out at their locker or in the hallway. They could be on their phone talking to their friends. Lunchtime, they could have it out. If mom or dad has to get a hold of them, they could still access, they could still talk to their mom and dad or whoever. But when it's time to learn, then your bill is addressing the learning time. It's time to learn. It's not time to talk on the phone. Is that correct? Follow up. Um, you're right, uh, Chairman. Um, but I will say that the LEAs have the right to decide how long, you know, the time frame that those cell phones are able to be used by the student. Follow because, up. Can I? Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Penny. So, because we wanted to give school boards who already had policies in place mm -hmm. to be able to have the freedom to use the policy that they were using. Chairman Speaky. But just to reference your bill. Yes. It only applies to during instruction. instructional. They could only regulate instructional time based off of the definition you provided of academic instruction, including classroom sessions, examinations, and other educational activities. That is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chairman Lafferty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sponsor. And I certainly do appreciate the spirit in which this bill's brought. Uh, seems to me that, well, let me let me back up. The Watching my daughter go through school, in middle school, when they walk through the door into a classroom. Chairman, make, make sure you get your microphone pulled over a little bit. Oh, sorry about that. Is that better? Yes, sir. Oh, 
during instruction time, when they walked into the classroom, they did have a, a rack that hung there that the kids dropped their phones in, and that was expected of them. Uh, I wish that parents did a better job coaching up their kids on how to behave and how to be prepared for school, but unfortunately, that's not the society we're in today. Uh, I wanted you to clarify, I thought that I heard you a couple of minutes ago, it almost sounded like you said giving the school districts the option, but I was reading in here, shall prohibit them from doing it. Did I did I misunderstand? Um, Representative Alexander. Option of writing their policy the way they want to write it, determining if they're going to put those cell phones on the wall in that rack or let the kid have them in their backpack or their choice. It was the school's option, but the bill still is the same as far as we do not want cell phone electronic devices out during instructional time. And it's a shell. Okay. Follow up, Chairman. Okay. So would this bill, this bill wouldn't touch private schools. It would just deal with it's charters just, and L. Just charter and um, um, charter and public schools. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, let's go to uh, Chairman Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to revisit maybe what was asked earlier. Do the LEAs? have that freedom to make that policy now? Representative? Yes, they do. Follow up. Keyword was freedom. They have the freedom to make it if they choose. Right. So they have the freedom now to create any policy they want around a cell phone. We are telling them you have to, correct me if I'm wrong, this is what I'm, what I'm getting from this conversation is we are telling them that now you must create a policy that says cell phones cannot be out during instructional time, of which they can do that now if they choose to. Representative Alexander? You're correct. Thank you. Uh, Representative Love? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I just received Metro Schools policy. My concern is that Metro Schools has in place a policy now governing use of cell phones and personal communication devices. What then does this bill do to their policy and their freedom to keep this policy? Representative Alexander? I, I don't know their policy, sir, so I'd have to look at it and see. I don't know. Follow up. And, and there lies my concern is that we got a huge number of school districts and everybody has, maybe everybody has a policy now, I don't know, because I haven't talked to all the school districts. And not trying to hurt your bill, but is, is it possible to, would you consider either rolling this a week to, to allow more study into it? Because I don't want to have a situation where our school districts that have policies now feel as though they have to increase the verbiage in their policy to, to then comply with state law. I would be at the will of the committee for that. Representative Alexander, you reckon? Representative Alexander, as we have the discussion, state one more time as you're spot the intent and what you understand or what your your bill is bringing before us. Make sure everybody has a clear understanding because we've kind of gone around a little bit on the world on some of this. Restate that one more time for the committee. Okay. The intent of the bill is to require local education agencies, LEAs, or public charter schools to develop and adopt a policy that prohibits students from displaying using, accessing an electronic device during instructional time unless the electronic device is authorized or provided to the student by the LEA or the charter school for instructional purposes. So even if 98% of our schools across Tennessee already had a policy in place, this is says you need to have a policy because from the state's perspective, 
uh, we believe that cell phones during instructional time should not be used. That is correct. Okay. Uh, Representative Slater. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I make a motion. We roll this bill one week. The motion is before us. Any objection to the motion to roll this bill for one week? Any objection? Seeing no objection, all those in favor of House Bill 2758 rolling one week. Any can be saying aye? aye. Opposed? Aye. The ayes have it. Roll one week. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Committee. Thank you. Item number five, House Bill Oh, one clarification. When we jumped over uh, item number two, which was House Bill 2480, that's being rolled one week. <laughs> item five, House Bill 2207 by Representative Davis. You're recognized. You have a motion and a second. Thank uh, you, Chairman. And so I do have an amendment that needs to be added to this, and the drafting code is 015304. It says it does not rewrite the bill, so I would like to ask you to explain the amendment so we can have before. I would to love to explain the amendment. Talk about it, and then we get uh, back to your bill. Thank you, sir. The amendment actually is um, something that the Department of Revenue asked for us to do for some clarification. They wanted to change the date. Uh, to October, and then also with regard to the definition of those products, because they have a partnership with um, sales and use tax across our state. It's called, um, hang on, it's the Streamline SSUT. And so if our definition is out of line with that, they've come out of compliance with that association. So just to clarify the definition that falls in line with by the request of the Department of Revenue, and then also their date, effective date. So, members, uh, amendment number 15304 does not rewrite the bill, but with that explanation, is there any objection to adding this amendment to the bill so we can have full discussion? Then a motion. Any objection? All those in favor of adding 15304 to House Bill 2207 indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Ayes have it. We are now on your bill as amended. You may explain your bill. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. And Currently, Tennessee um, taxes feminine hygiene products as a non-essential luxury good. And this means that such public assistance programs such as TANF and WIC don't cover the cost of, of these products. This, um, for it's estimated that the average girl or woman in Tennessee spends about approximately $180 each year on feminine hygiene products. What we're wanting to accomplish with this legislation is that a percentage of the sales tax from the purchase of those products would go towards a fund that LEAs could draw down upon and have those products available to those young ladies in our in our high school setting, and they would be in the the ladies um, the ladies restroom, but not in staff. Okay, we uh, have those uh, that explanation. Members, uh, let me start the questions out. Now, last week in subcommittee where I got hung up was on that 20 percent. We were asking for, uh, I understand and I agree with the concept of your bill, but where 20 percent of the tax revenue goes to buy the products on those products. So that's what they're requesting. The They're requesting that that 20 percent of those products that are sold across our state from that sales 20 percent of the sales tax for those specific products would go to create that fund okay now does f and a where did they come down with this um i'm pretty sure that that any sort of funds that come from the general fund they're they're not going to be supportive of but we're going to try to work with um with our folks and see if we can try to to talk to fiscal and see if we can um work on some things in order to present some better information in finance, if the committee so inclines to move it forward. Okay, let's go to, uh, we got uh, Chairman Warner. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I really hate to ask this question, but I feel like it needs to be asked. Will these products be restricted to the ladies' restroom? Yes, sir. If you look at the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Am I recognized? Um, if you look, at uh, section two, section B, it says that each LEA and public charter school shall provide 
those products at no charge in all women's and girls' bathrooms, locker rooms, and with the school nurse in those eligible school buildings. So in the clinic and then the, the women's ladies' rooms and, and restrooms. Do you follow up? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Reps and Parson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm I'm literally scratching my head about where I don't where else would they be relegated to? Well, we wanted to make sure they weren't in staff in this in the I apologize, I should have been recognized. You're, you're recognized. It, so we wanted to make sure that they were available to the students. Okay. Okay. And Mr. Chair, just a quick follow-up I, I, in comment. I just want to thank you for bringing the bill. I think this is a great piece of legislation, very smart, very well thought out piece of legislation. And I actually want to sign on to it. I hope it doesn't sink your bill with me signing on to it, but I do want to <laughs> sign on to it. I appreciate that. Thank, thank you for you. that. Well, I think what it also does is it highlights the necessity of it. Um, there's a uh, There are statistics that show that some young ladies uh, are absent from school because they don't have the necessary products to attend. And um, speaking from experience, there's been numerous times where um, I've been put in an embarrassing situation, and we want to make sure that our ladies are there to concentrate on being good students. And some of the things that happen, if we can try to make sure that we're avoiding it as much unintended consequences during the day for our, for our young ladies, I'd like to do that. Do you want to follow up? Reverend. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your indulgence. Just what 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 um, grade levels will these be made available? So, I'd love for it to be in middle school and high school, but we're mm. we're trying to start at high school, and even with the high school, we've got quite a quite a large hurdle with our fiscal notes. So, we're going to try to work on that and try to see if we can kind of refine it down. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks again for bringing. Thank you, Reverend Bolso. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, sponsor. Uh, my question uh, relates to the chairman's question about the 20%, just for my own edification. Do we have uh, in code right now the same structure with any other sales tax? That is, do we segregate any portion of sales tax collected and direct it to a specific use? To follow up. I mean, you're that's right a good question, and I will have to research that for you. I would have to go back and look. Okay. Yeah. And for, for my position, I totally support the concept of your bill. I, I understand that. And I, and I like what we're doing. Where I have an issue is if you're taking, since we're not an income tax state, we depend on sales tax and you're taking 20% of the sales tax to putting it back into something we prescribe here in committee. If we did that on a hundred products, we couldn't balance our budget. So that is where I'm concerned moving right. forward with, with that particular language. Uh, that might can be decided in, in finance committee. That's up to the, to everyone. But um, that's my concern. I, I, I love the bill. I'm just concerned about how we get there. And I agree. One of the things that we tried to do is we tried to look at the census data and look at the number of wom women that are, are populated in the state of Tennessee. And then from that, look at the age range that would uh, purchase those products and then kind of just kind of drill down from there. Um, that's something that that we're obviously flexible with doing. And I think that if there's the potential to maybe um, reduce that number or reduce that percentage, I'm obviously open to that. We're just looking to try to make sure that, that we start and have um, schools have the ability to provide these for our young ladies. I know that um, when my children were in school and, and when I substitute taught, the clinic was always asking for different requests of different items because they never seemed to have enough of anything. And these were one of the things that were uh, always a requested item that usually when you're when your child has a, a teacher's list of supplies, those are the ones that you have to, to purchase for your teacher's supply list. But a lot of times the clinic gets overlooked. And so a lot of times this specific product is something that a lot of people don't really think of donating. Well, well thank, thank you very much. Um, anyone else would like to ask a, a sponsor a question about this bill? Uh, Chairman Lafferty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we, we talked about this a little bit. My my concern is the when it's in the public restroom like that, there's a lot of opportunity for them to just walk off. Uh, maybe it would help with the fiscal note if it were limited to the clinics or to the principal's office or something along those lines. Just, just wanted to put that out there. Uh, as a dad that 
carried around a teenage daughter uh, and my wife would follow up with me before we would leave to go someplace. Don't forget to take. Yes, ma'am. I got you. Uh, so I, I understand the dilemma for sure. Uh, but maybe if it were just limited to a couple of spaces, it would help with your physical note a little bit. But just want to put that out there. Thank you, sponsor. Thank you. Chairman Speaker. Yeah, okay. Further questions, comments, discussion on House Bill 2207? See, the question's been called. Any objection? All those in favor of House Bill 2207 moving out to finance indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. it. Moves out to finance. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. Thank you, Representative Davis. Uh, item number six, House Joint Resolution 857 by Representative Hale. You have a motion and a second on your resolution. When you're ready, you are recognized on House Joint Resolution 857. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Committee. Uh, House Joint Resolution is just simply a, a resolution. Uh, as all of you are aware, the uh, winter storm that we had in uh, January um, and uh, many of the school systems, I've had a uh, few uh, school directors that have asked that uh, for us to ask the commissioner to forgive those snow days that was missed that week. Uh, some had had to use some uh, inclement weather days back in the fall with some storms and then we still got two months left and there's uh, even uh, I think Friday a, a chance of severe weather and uh, some of our counties not just snow that they have to deal with but they have to deal with flooding and, and other things so uh, this that we as we know that week uh, of course Cordell Hull we were closed that week uh, State government, many of the offices were closed that week. TVA asked us to conserve power. So this is just simply a resolution asking the commissioner uh, to forgive those days, uh, and which most of them would be four days uh, because a lot of the school systems were closed that Monday uh, already. So that's all this resolution is. Okay, members, with that explanation on the resolution by Representative Hale, discussion, any questions? Representative... Uh, before you had the question, I had the chairman speaking. Okay. Okay. Any objection to the question? Hearing none, all those in favor of House Joint Resolution 857 going out to calendar rules indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Moves out. Uh, Representative Hale, you also ha have item number seven, House Bill 1914. You do have a motion in a second. I see no amendments. You are, go ahead and explain your bill. Uh, House Bill 1914, uh, this bill creates a hunger-free campus program which aims to address food insecurity in higher education. Uh, there's, there's certain uh, guidelines and, and things they have to have or establish a physical food pantry that is accessible to students, partner with a food pantry that is accessible to students uh, and located in the same community as the campus. Uh, establish a task force, including at least two members of the student body to examine the needs. Um, this was uh, brought to us, uh, uh, of course, there was a study that was done uh, that this, uh, that the General Assembly had uh, requested. And so THEC had done this 18 month uh, uh, study and they gave the report. Um, Tennessee's average is 30%. The national average is, is between 23 and 34. So we're on the high end of, of the average. Uh, this uh, bill is supported by THEC, the uh, uh, National Organization Swipe Out Hunger, uh, Tennessee Student Base uh, Needs Coalition, TBR, and uh, several other student government associations. Uh, and uh, Second Harvest uh, is in support of this bill also. So with that, I stand for question. And we do also have uh, Chairman uh, Lou uh, with THEC is here to answer any questions and to testify on behalf of this as well. Okay, members, do you have any objection? I would like to bring uh, Mr. Hanneman up. I do want to ask a couple questions. Uh, any objection to uh, going out of session? That objection, uh, Mr. Hanneman? 
Thank you. I want to recognize you. I started out with, you can make any comments. We're up here having a discussion. It seems like we have done something like this through uh, completion grants and things through a higher education. Could you give us a little background and refresh our memory? Uh, sure thing. Lou Hanneman with the Tennessee Higher Education Commission. Uh, if you'll recall, a couple of years ago, a um, piece of legislation brought by Representative Jernigan and others um, asked THEC to uh, conduct a survey across all of our post public post-secondary um, institutions across the state, looking deeply at you know what is the state of food insecurity across our campuses. This is a growing national issue, not just as related to COVID, but just in general. Um, what we found was that um, across our institutions, about 30% of our students are uh, suffering from some degree of food insecurity. Um, this may be a lack of uh, simply financial resources to you know, provide food at home, but it also might mean uh, the lack of access to um, appropriate nutrition, appropriate food resources during the day while they're on campus and at school. Uh, this varies, of course, by institution type. Some of our institutions have pretty robust um, either relationships with local food pantry organizations or have their own um, that are also open to the community in addition to their students. Um, what I think, you know, what came out of that, um, out of that study were a number of recommendations um, of which one of them was a piece of legislation like the Hunger Free Campus Bill, which would help campuses, if funded, to establish relationships with local pantries if they don't have that already but also to conduct additional surveys on their campus um, to explore other uh, access to resources such as uh, SNAP and being able to communicate uh, those types of things to their student bodies um, and, and so forth. Happy to answer any other questions. We, we have run similar type grant programs uh, before, not so much around food insecurity, but certainly one-off grant programs we certainly have. Can members anybody like to ask uh, Mr. Hanneman, while we're out in recess, uh, Resident Bolso. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Hanneman, for being here. Uh, if I understand the bill correctly, it uh, would, if implemented, establish a food pantry on campus. And my question simply is, is it the case that all of the students who attend the school would have access to the food pantry regardless of need? Response. I think the administration of uh, of how each campus runs their food pantry would probably be up to them. Um, establishing a food pantry is one uh, in an array of options. If they don't have a pantry or if they don't have an existing relationship with a local community pantry, um, it doesn't have to be on campus per se. It can be uh, that kind of relationship. Um, I think it would, I, I think most of these probably are open to anyone on campus who has a demonstrated need, i.e. they show up and, and request the food. I don't know that there's any litmus on campus that you would have to fill out a, or, or some kind of criteria uh, for income or otherwise. Representative Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I appreciate the bill, and I appreciate you um, uh, answering a few questions on this. So I have just a couple. With the, with the backdrop, Roan State Foundation supports the pantry, as I recall, at Roan State Community College. It's primarily on, on donations. So can you help me understand uh, how, how we're going to fund this? What are the finances of this going to be long term? And how, what, what's our vision for that? And if that's more appropriate for the sponsor, I'll hold it. Uh, and then just a second quick follow-up, and I'll be done, Mr. Chairman. Is there a delta between our community colleges and our... TCATs and our universities for the food insecurity? Because it is a real problem. Uh, it, it is real. And do you see a difference there? Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Hanneman. Absolutely. And, and I'll take a crack at kind of how we would dispense the funds. If, if there was funding provided, I'll leave whether or not there will be funding to Representative Hale. Um, what we have looked at when, when we did a, in addition to surveying all of our you know, in-state campuses. We did a national study on how this bill and others like it have been rolled out um, uh, across the country. And what we found was that there's basically a range uh, between ten and forty thousand dollars, depending on the institution type. And so, for our TCATs um, who don't have students staying overnight, don't you know, maybe don't have as high a traffic um, as say a university might, you know, then ten thousand dollars to establish a partnership where they can, you know, essentially buy into or, or donate to, you know, the, an existing resource. Um, and so we would look at, you know, 
we would invite campuses to uh, submit their proposals and then kind of award grants, you know, based on that with a tiered structure, depending on institution type. Um, as to the, the differences between those, I think it speaks exactly to why we would fund these at different levels. Um, I can get you the, the precise numbers on what that survey looks like. In fact, I'll, I'll be sure to send along the, the link to the report itself. It has a, a significant amount of uh, information in there about the differences between our TCAT students and our community college students, because um, they are very, they are very real differences. Thank you, uh, Chairman Sapicki. Uh, while we're in recess. Excuse me. In section one, number two, A2, you see that? A private post-secondary institution accredited by a regional, would that would this apply to private private four-year colleges too? They would be invited to submit proposals for the grants as well. So so public money could be going to a private university. You recognize? It's conceivable, sure. Thank you. Chairman Reagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question revolves around a, a previous uh, program that we, we passed in here. Uh, I think this was primarily on Tennessee Promise, where we were losing students because they needed gas money to get to uh, the, the colleges and stuff like that. Is, is that not, is this not covered under that kind of grant program that we already have in place? So, Mr. Hanneman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think you're referring to the completion grant um, program where we did have a pilot program that has now been sustained with additional funds. And I think there's some discussion about continuing that further. Uh, the purpose of that grant are uh, much more one-off instances in any given semester. Um, and so wouldn't be, those wouldn't be grants to address things like daily food needs. They would be more um, directed towards, you know, did your car break down? Did you have a medical emergency? Did you need a textbook in particular for a class? Things that would inhibit you from enrolling from one semester to the next. I don't think those funds are fluid enough or, or uh, extendable enough to contemplate, you know, day by day grants. And you're only allowed one grant per semester is my understanding. Thank Chairman, you. Chairman Reagan. Okay, members, while we're out in recess, anybody have a question for Mr. Hanneman of THEC? Chairman speaking. Uh, uh, Mr. Henneman, are you aware of any other states that have something like this that we could pull information from? Uh, yes, sir. There are a number of states. Some of them are border states to us, um, particularly down here in the south. I think Alabama, Louisiana, and a handful of others. Um, in fact, I can tell you, well, I, I'll, I'll get a list for you. We, there are a number of states who've implemented this this specific piece of legislation. In our survey, we found that uh, just about every state has some form within their institutional system, some form of food uh, insecurity program. Follow up. And then just to make sure, in this, pro that, that'll be for the bill sponsor. Okay. Any further questions while we're out of session? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Hanneman. Appreciate it. We're now back in session, back on the bill. Chairman Spickey. Uh, and just to follow up with that. So the, my thought process is, uh, is your intention in this bill is if a student shows up in need of food, that this bill would address a need, no matter what their financial situation is, no matter what their status is socioeconomically, in your, in your intent of the bill is if they show up and, and they're asking for food, it would be provided. Representative Hales. Yes. Wouldn't yes. be no discrimination in it. All right, thank you. Representative Bolso. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, sponsor, for bringing this. And I, obviously, I support the idea of no student being hungry, whether it's higher education or secondary or elementary. But th there are two parts of this structure that, that do concern me. One is that the, the food pantry, the benefit is available to those even who don't have a demonstrated need which I can see perhaps limiting the usefulness of this program to those who truly are in need. And then second, uh, allowing private institutions to participate in the program strikes me as a bit of a problem because 
I think where possible, it's good to reduce entanglement between the state government and private institutions. And private institutions should be able to make sure their students are adequately fed if there are students there with a need. So could you address, uh, sponsor the, those two concerns? One, uh, why it is that under this structure, those who really have no demonstrated need can participate? And two, why we are extending this benefit to private institutions? President Hill. There we go. First of all, I, I think the uh, representative also that, um, and kind of going back to what Representative Speaky asked, that you know, trying to be able to not discriminate in any. I think any time we do something like this, there's going to be a a portion of misuse, or, or maybe they don't need it, but they still take advantage of it. We see that in a lot of charitable things that we do. But then the, the other part, um, this legislation was was um, brought up and drawn off of other similar uh, states that have done similar uh, food hunger uh, bills. And I have absolutely no problem if it makes the committee feel better to make some changes to that of rolling it a week, amending to to take out the the private school part, you know, I don't have a bit of problem with that to make that where it's, you know, to address those concerns. So, you know. Representative Bolso. Thank you, Mr. Sponsor. Let me then make that motion to roll it a week because I'd like to be able to support this, but I'd like to support a bill that doesn't allow those who are not in need to benefit from it. And I do like the idea of limiting it to to public institutions, not private institutions. So I'll move, Mr. Chairman, that we roll this one week to allow us to modify. We have a motion and a second to roll House Bill 1914 by one week. Any objection? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hill. You also have one more item number eight, House Bill 2818. Uh, you are recognized. You got a motion second on your bill. I see you may have a that you do have a amendment that does not rewrite the bill. And like we've been doing, would you go ahead and, and explain amendment one five four nine zero? Okay, the amendment uh, oh, is a friendly one, amendment. One second, Chairman. One yes. second. I didn't. See that. I am going to recognize the sponsor of the amendment, Chairman Sapicki. Yes. Uh, Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a very simple amendment. It just adds one clarifying sentence, and I've already talked. I've already talked to the bill sponsor on this, and he says it is a friendly amendment. Uh, what we're going to add in here is in the second paragraph where it says a student enrolled in a public school in any of the grades nine through twelve who, and then here's what we're going to add in, is in good academic standing as determined by the school principal of the public school in which the student is enrolled must be temporarily excused. We're just adding that the student's going to be in good academic standing. That's all, Mr. Chairman. That's what the amendment does. Okay, members, with that explanation of Amendment 15490 by Chairman Sapicki, any questions to the uh, sponsor of the amendment? Motion to adopt. There's been a motion to adopt. I have a second. Any objection? That objection. All those in favor, add Amendment 15490 to 2818 House Bill. Indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? We now have amend, uh, amended that. So House Bill 2818, President Hill. Thank you, Chairman and Committee, again. Uh, and I appreciate the conversation that uh, that uh, Representative Sapicki and I had uh, to bring that amendment in. Basically, what House Bill uh, 2818, and they, uh, this group of students had worked with uh, uh, Chairman uh, Haston and, and I think some others that had had some input on this. It encourages students to be engaged with the civic process. Um, these students, uh, of course, brought this. Students in grades 9 through 12 would be excused from school for one day to attend a state or local legislative meeting, visit a place of historic or civic significance, uh, participate in civic activity, uh, volunteer, uh, whatever. Uh, they would be required to, the parents would have a, uh, would sign a permission slip, then the excuse would be uh, granted by the principal. Uh, upon their return to school, the, the student must submit a one-page essay on the event they attended, uh, what they learned from it. Um, and uh, there's other states that, that have passed similar legislation to this. 
Um, and of course, that excused absence, uh, if they miss a test or anything that day, then that would fall under whatever their policy is uh, for the school. So uh, with that, I stand for any other questions. Okay, members, with that explanation, on 2818, we have uh, Chairman Lafferty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we talked a little bit earlier. I was just uh, wanted to express a concern about overzealous parties uh, going in and taking advantage maybe of this bill to drag a bunch of kids out of school for a short-term political gain. We are talking about politicians here. Uh, just a little bit concerned about that. And how do we how do we keep an eye on that if it gets out of control where it does turn out to be a case where half the classroom ends up going out and campaigning one day? Wow. Resident Hill? Uh, I think uh, hopefully that with the amendment that we've added, that that brings that, that those students are going to be students that are in good standing and not uh, those that slack and and lack in school, that, that they're definitely involved in school and have good grades and, and involvement to be able to be excused to start with. Thank you, sponsor. Thank you, Chair. Members, any further discussion on House Bill 2818? Seeing none, any reason we can't call the question? That objection, all those in favor of moving House Bill 2818 out to calendar rules in the case of saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. It does move up. Thank you, Representative Hale. Let's move on. We've got a few more. Uh, House Bill 2826, item number nine, which is Leader Camper. You have a motion and a second, Leader Camper. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. I'm here today to talk about uh, conflict resolution programs in our school system. As you all know, school safety is a major concern for everyone, and parents, teachers, students, and the community want safe and orderly schools. Mm -hmm. There are um, it's a clear need for our kids and students to and teachers to, you know, work constructively to uh, resolve conflict. Conflict resolution programs have been uh, proven over the years to see significant reduction in suspensions, disciplinary referrals, academic disruptions, playground fights, and uh, violence overall. So, in fact, since 1990, since 1965, um, the U.S. have had these types of policies in schools, and they've proven to work. Here in Tennessee, since 1999, we've had the policies here in uh, our LEAs to provide these type of intervention um, programs. What this bill does, Mr. Chairman and committee, is it requires the department to use their existing resources to help or uh, to develop conflict resolution programs that may be adopted or impl and implemented by LEAs and public charter schools to assist students uh, in, in, in any grades from K through 12. Secondly, expands on what's already existing in law requiring public schools, uh, public charter schools, in addition to LEAs to implement the conflict resolution programs from uh, grades one through six. Uh, the department is deferred on this bill. Uh, the fiscal note is not significant and it has already passed the Senate 32 So with that, I'd appreciate your support mm -hmm. on this bill. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a very good bill. A conflict res resolution is very important. Uh, Resident Parkson, did you have a bill like this a few years ago that we discussed also? Not to hurt her bill, but... Pro okay. Probably so, but you probably killed it because you was mad at me at the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. No, I see the value. As I told members of this committee, I went back and got a master's in conflict resolution, and it's really a valuable thing that when people know how to work together and things. So uh, I appreciate the intent of the bill. Uh, members, anybody have a question of Leader Camper? Uh, how about uh, Rep Representative Slater? Thank you, and thank you, sponsor, for bringing this bill. I think that it is important, and thank you for recognizing that when it comes to improving school safety and security, it really is an implemental approach, and we need to take one step at a time and uh, work toward it, and working together, we can improve school security, and I think that this bill will help and assist with that. Thank you so much for bringing this legislation. Leader Camper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative, for that. I, I totally agree with I totally agree with your statement. I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that with me. 
And one of the main tenets in conflict resolution is listen first, speak second. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a question? Uh, Chairman Hurt. Sponsor, thank you for this. And I'm going to take it a step further. I want to challenge you to, can you bring one to require conflict resolution for the General Assembly next year? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Woo, praise the Lord. Uh, do, you, do you want to propose an amendment on that? I'd, uh, I'd vote for that. <laughs> Any further discussion on House Bill 2826 by Leader Camper? Seeing none. Without objection, all those in favor moving House Bill 2826 to calendar rules indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Moves out. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman of the Committee. Chairman Reagan, item number 10, House Bill 2346. You got a motion to second on your bill. I see you have an amendment. Tell us what amendment you want. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My amendment is 13453. 13453. And is, it does rewrite the bill. It does rewrite the bill. Members, any objection to adding this to the bill so we have proper discussion? Hearing none. I was in favor of adding amendment 13453 to House Bill 2346. Indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Your bill is amended. Chairman Reagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, many of us will recall uh, back in 2015-16 time frame, we passed the FOCUS Act, uh, wherein we created locally governed institutions. Uh, if you Before that time, the, the Board of Regents had not only the community colleges and TCATs, but they also had four-year institutions with something over 200,000 students, something more than, than they really could say grace over. So we passed the FOCUS Act, which reduced T, uh, TBR to oversight of community colleges and TCATs and the effect has been laudatory. They have done a great job. When we created these LGIs uh, with the independents, they each have their own board of trustees and so forth, uh, a problem is that we didn't foresee the possibility that any of these institutions would ever have uh, leadership vacated, as in a board of trustees uh, vacated by this body. So what this bill does basically is allow THEC in the event such were to occur, to serve as a guidance uh, oversight body for any university until such time as a board of trustees was reappointed. And with that said, there are a bunch of amendments on it, which we didn't talk about. If I could, please, sir, I'll just summarize the amendments as being efforts to uh, get agreements from uh, everybody concerned that this is, in fact, a good thing if that should happen. Are these amendments that have been added previously? or No, I'm sorry. I said an amendment. I said a bunch. Uh, a bunch got reduced to one. So uh, there was a lot of effort to try to make this as palatable as possible. That's okay. what that's about. Okay, you're recognized to explain. Is that what, is that what you want to do? Explain or are you? I, I'm ready for questions, sir. Okay. Uh, Representative Love. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are we on the amendment or... We're, we're on the, the bill. We amended okay. it, rewrites the bill, so we amended it to the bill, so we're on the bill. All right, thank you. And, and sponsor, I, I truly understand uh, the, the efforts and the intent of the legislation. You and I did discuss, and I need to get you an, an amendment at some point because my concern is that if you look at the bill, and members, if you look at the, the legislation, uh, it does not make a provision for the student or a faculty member from the current institution to be on the higher education commission at the time. And so I think it's important that, so let's say a school does not get its board renewed and they fall into this category. The current posture is that the student trustee and the faculty trustee at THEC board aren't from that institution because there's no way you can predict what school it would be. And so I think a good addition may be that we make sure that at least a student trustee and a faculty trustee from that school that's in this posture sits on the THEC board with the provision that once the board is reconstituted or renewed, they then come off of THEC board. So that's what I put before the committee. Chairman Reagan. I have no problem with that concept. We did have that discussion, but I didn't get your amendment in time to put it on. Uh, I'm at the will of the committee on that. Okay. Uh, Representative Love, any further comments on that? Well, Mr. Chair, let me ask you, procedurally, I know we have concerns about putting amendments on on the floor. 
sometimes. So, sometimes. <laughs> For sure. I think the only, if you if the sponsor of the bill does not have an issue with that, and we, we're going to be in here a few more weeks, we can give it another week and put the amendment on. Uh, if not, it's, it's going to go to GovOps. What, can you add it in GovOps? Chair? Actually, sir, it's not our policy to, but there is no rule that prohibits it. Uh, if the uh, gentleman wants to bring that amendment in GovOps, uh, I'll have a discussion with the clerk, and we can probably get an exception to our longstanding habit. Hey, chairman speaking. Second. Okay, any objections to that motion? So without objection, we're going to uh, roll one week House Bill 2346 by Chairman Reagan. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I look forward to a timely yes, submission. Yes, sir, I will talk to legal today if they're watching. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Re Chairman Reagan, House Bill 1855 is yours. You're recognized. Uh, Your motion second. And this is the one that has a bunch of amendments on it, Mr. Chair. Okay, so uh, are we going with all of them or one of them? Actually, I'll do about the same thing. So the last one that was put on or submitted, I think, was uh, uh, 14529. 14529 is the amendment that rewrites the bill. Okay, uh, members, 14529 rewrites the bill. Any injection is adding that amendment to his bill for proper discussion? Can we do that? Give me just one second, make sure we're getting this in the proper posture. Okay, Chairman Reagan, that 14529, but then we have a later amendment that also rewrites the bill. Well, amendment. I'm, I may have the numbers mis mixed up, sir. I want the last one. 15368 rewrites the bill. That's the one I want then. Okay, so we're not we're not without objection. We're going to remove the one four five two nine discussion. Members, we're on uh, amendment one five three. Got a motion and second rewrites the bill. Any objection to adding that to his bill so we can have proper discussion? Hearing none. Uh, all those in favor, add the amendment to the bill. Indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed. The ayes have it. We have that amendment one five three six eight on your bill. You may now describe your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. By way of explanation of that amendment, I was working with universities in our system to try to get this into a, uh, a situation where it was most palatable to them. Essentially, what this bill does is direct universities to create an academic research security policy against foreign espionage. You might ask, why is that necessary? There are numerous reports, of which I'm sure you may be aware, that the Chinese government is stealing data, technology, and research. In 2019, a U.S. Senate investigation uh, reported that China has an immense program to attack, attract researchers to the, to the West, the largest of which is called the 10,000 Talents Program. FBI website says it incentivizes members to steal foreign technologies needed to advance Chinese goals, and it targets researchers with existing jobs at research institutions to sign contracts to forbid sharing breakthroughs with anyone except China without China's approval. Furthermore, in 2019, the Department of Justice reported an 80% economic espionage cases involving China, 8% increase there. And we have a duty uh, because so many of our institutions, and especially uh, our flagship university, uh, does a great deal of research. Now, let me say in their defense, a lot of the research that they do already, like, for example, with Oak Ridge National Lab, is protected by virtue of some federal uh, procedures that in place are in place. However... Those, they do not cover some of the things I just mentioned, like the foreign students uh, participating and so forth. Again, uh, having been part of the federal anti-espionage program in my dim, dark past, I will tell you that uh, it's very effective as far as it goes. The problem is, like most of us, it can't foresee everything. And inviting all of our institutions of higher learning to be involved in it, I think, is going to increase the likelihood that we can stops uh, some of this damage from going forward. With that, I stand ready for questions. Thank you for the explanation, uh, Chairman Reagan. Members, anybody have a question of the bill that's before us? Question. Question's been called. Any objection? Seeing none, all those in favor of House Bill 1855, moving out to finance, and the saying say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Moves out, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair Committee.
Okay, we doing good work. We got just two more. Uh, House Bill, item number 12, House Bill 902 by Chairman Hurt. You're recognized. Got a motion second on your bill. I also see you may have a, a couple of amendments that we need to look at. I believe there's just one amendment, Mr. Chair. Okay. Zero one two six zero oh, nine. Well, that's the last one added. It does rewrite the bill. Members, we're on uh, amendment. We got a motion second on amendment one two six zero nine. Rewrites the bill. Any objection to adding it to the bill? So we have proper discussion. Here and none. All those in favor adding the amendment to the bill nine zero two. Any capable of saying aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Chairman Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. House Bill 902 has come to be known um, as the data bill. Members, as, as all of you know, we spend a lot of time and, and enormous resources collecting data as a state. Um, with that being said, that data is scattered all over the place and, and it's hard to find it and, and make it completely useful. So work began on this and we moved this bill through subcommittee last year and parked it in full committee to allow more work to be done um, over the last year in order for other departments to get things done and kind of fulfill some commitments where we can get to the point where we are now. So um, we, we bring the amendment for House Bill 902. And with this, this bill helps create a strategic alignment across education and the workforce to ensure the state has a clear understanding of how education is or is not meeting the needs of Tennessee's rapidly evolving economy. Specifically, the bill codifies access to and use of education to workforce data from the state's longitudinal data system. The Department of Finance and Administration has been working towards improving access to, it, to information. This bill requires publicly available interactive data dashboards that elevate trends in student progress from education to careers. This legislation will provide critical insight on how the state's educational offerings, including career and technical education and higher education institutions, prepare students for success in the workforce. These dashboards will increase transparency for policymakers, business leaders, educators, and communities. This bill supports and ensures Tennessee's vision for using data to improve and to monitor education investments. We need to improve access and use and use of this data to understand whether students are supported to be successful and to meet the needs of our state's economy. And with that being said, obviously there's been a ton of work done behind the scenes on this. And uh, we do have a representative from SCORE available. They've been leading the charge on this and, and having these deep discussions. So she is, uh, they are available for, for questions. Obviously it's an in-depth bill and a lot to it. So I'll be glad Mr. Chairman to, to have her answer, help, help answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Chairman Hurt. And Actually, I would also. I've said it on a lot of meetings. Thank you for bringing this. This this is a very difficult process. I've said it on meetings, and as I've gone around the country and different education committees, some states are doing this, but there's a lot of moving pieces, and I've been in meetings here. So appreciate this. Uh, any objection to bringing Ms. Guthrie up from SCORE to kind of give us a little more background uh, on this? Any objection? Seeing none. We're in recess for short time uh miss guthrie if you could kind of give us a little background on this too i think it'd be very helpful to the committee yes sir thank you my name is alia guthrie and i work for tennessee score um thank you chairman her i'm um, chairman white and committee um this is something that we've been working on for several years and want to say that the department of finance and administration has already they, they have a team that's working on this they are looking at education data labor data and they're helping they're helping put that together so we can understand are our investments our programs policies and education actually setting students up for a life of economic independence um, and what we're seeking to do through this legislation is just to codify that good work and to ensure we're we're really clear about what dashboards we would want created um, and annually updated so we would have that into the future um, in this administration, the Lee administration cares about education. They care about workforce development. Um, so we, we feel like this is the time to sort of put that into the statute so that we are sure we can keep monitoring those investments for the long term. Okay. Members, you have a question of Ms. Guthrie. We also have F and A. If anybody wants to talk to F Finance Administration, they're also here. Uh, 
to uh, answer any questions. But uh, to have this complete dashboard of data it was, is such a great thing for our state when we pull that together. Members, questions of Ms. Guthrie? Representative Balso. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Ms. Guthrie. It's a pleasure to see you again. I just have a couple of W questions, uh, who, what, where, and why. With regard to the dashboard, uh, what uh, will actually be on the dashboard? Uh, who will likely be accessing it? And what is the purpose for which they would be accessing it? Yes. You Thank recognize. You. Um, so on page three of the bill in se um, subsection D, it says... It calls out three, or sorry, four different dashboards. So that's the what would be on the dashboard: um, college going and post secondary completion rates by high school, college going and workforce outcomes by CTE program of study, post secondary completion rates and workforce outcomes by institution, and post secondary completion rates and workforce outcomes by instructional program. So that we can look at what are students receiving when they're in high school and when they're in higher education. And how does that connect to life after high school and after higher education and their job placements rates, their wage, um, so we can really understand what's working and what might need tweaking. Um, those who would access this, we want these to be public facing. Right now, you can request this data from the Department of Finance and Administration. Um, and so there's a, there's a process to request it. But what we're hoping is by making public dashboards accessible, that it would be actionable by policymakers, um, business leaders, chambers of commerce, um, educators. I think, you know, when I, I think about school counselors in a high school setting or college counselors, to be able to say, these are the programs that if you focus on that, you can expect these types of outcomes on average. Um, so using that information directly with students and families. Who, what... And where would it be located? <laughs> it would be um, on the Department of Finance and Administration. They have a, a team. Um, it's called the Office of Evidence and Impact. And they have a website, um, but it doesn't have any public-facing dashboard. So that's where we would um, expect this dashboard to live um, so that it would be easy to find and all sort of in one spot. Uh, Representative Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ma'am. Fully supportive of trying to do this. Um, question would be on leading and lagging indicators that we would develop into the dashboards. Could you talk a little bit about the vision of how you would use lagging indicators to develop leading indicators and help us adjust moving forward? Ms. Guthrie. Thank you. So in the current longitudinal data system, um, there is data from contributing entities that are higher ed, K-12, labor. Um, there's also data from DHS, DCS, um, and ECD. So there's, it's, it's not everything. There's just a few, there, there's a list I can share with you, maybe share with you um, if I come by your office. So there's the data that is currently in the system that they would be reporting out on, but we're, we were trying to craft the language of the legislation to not preclude them from adding other indicators down the road. And the dashboards, the four dashboards that are called for here, um, it's sort of included but not limited to. So if they wanted to report on other metrics into the future, if they wanted to add data from other state agencies or other entities um, to kind of build out a really robust understanding, you know, maybe there would be Department of Health or Department of Corrections. I, I don't know. Right now, their system includes higher ed, K-12, and labor data um, and some specific metrics. But the, the bill is written intentionally to be able to add, um, and it also calls for sort of a process with potential users to figure out what would be most meaningful. Uh, Chairman Spicky. And on the, uh, on H2, page three, talks about the department in coordination with the Longitudinal Dead Advisory Committee at the last bit. So the here's is economic development going to be able to share this information with other states, with other entities who want to come to Tennessee and invest? I think that is a potential use of the public facing information that there's um, multiple places in the bill where privacy and security are insured. We're just talking about aggregate information. I think that is a, a likely use to say 
um, when, when we are recruiting you as a business to come into our community, we're not just making a promise about the workforce pipeline. We can actually show you the data. We have students that are being trained in this area that will be ready by X date. So we know that we can fill the jobs that, we would, that we're trying to recruit. Um, I think that right now that data is sometimes difficult to get when you're having those conversations with potential businesses to move to Tennessee. And um, that is, that's why we included state and local workforce development entities as one of the, one of the groups that would be coordinated with for the design of the dashboard. Follow up. And on follow, and, and I'm, I'm scanning it, so I may have missed it. it. Is this going to be open? Is this dashboard going to be open to the public in general? to yes, where sir. anybody who has access to the web can gain entrance into this information? Yes, sir. And, and this, is, this is not um, individualized data. This is aggregate level data. So similar to um, the dashboards we have for our TDOE data, we have a state report card where you can look at some basic metrics about school performance. Um, there's a college mm -hmm. for TN dashboard that has information about higher ed. So it would be a, a public-facing dashboard with some key metrics that, yes, would be available for you all. It would be for chambers, for any educator, any, any person who's interested in understanding how our education system is leading to workforce development. Then we have one last. Uh, Reverend Ritchie. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cook. On the forward-facing side, will there be any link between the FNA website and like the Department of Education or any of the other websites to where folks that are where it's accessible, where more people can end up seeing it? Do you know that? You recognize? So it's not prescribed in the bill that the website would have, you know, a link where you could then be directed to the Department of Education's dashboards or or any other dashboards, um, that seems like a good idea that you would help direct people to where they could kind of learn more or find, you know, deeper information that's about a specific sector. Um, but the bill doesn't prescribe that the dashboard has to include those, those links. Thank you. Anyone else a question while we're in recess? Seeing none, Ms. Guthrie, thank you so very much. We're back in session. And members, before I go back and recognize the sponsor, uh, if I could be out of order for a moment, we have one of the great institutions in our state is Leadership Tennessee. We have the state director, Mr. Alfred de Graffenreed. Would you stand up, sir? Yeah. I went through class four. What are we on, class 10 or 11 now? Please. Class 10 and also have leadership next. Well, these are great leadership institutions. And so thank you for being here and uh, thank you for your hard work. Uh, you want to have a recognition before I go back to Chairman Hurt? Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And since you uh, you 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 opened that door, and I, I'd also like to to recognize that they uh, weren't in the room. Uh, there are nine uh, organizations part of the Divine Nine, uh, and we have two of our members, uh, Representative Larry Miller and Representative Joe Towns, who are members of the other uh, fraternity founded in 1911. And Mr. Alfred uh, de Graffenried is one of them. So if they stand, we recognize them as well. Kappa Alpha Psi. Thank you. Appreciate y'all being here. Let's go back to the sponsor of the amendment, excuse me, of House Bill 902, Chairman Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I appreciate the questions. I appreciate the assistance answering from, uh, from the representative from SCORE. But uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I renew my motion. Okay, the, new, the motion's been renewed. Any further discussion? Any objection to the question? Seeing none, all those in favor of House Bill 902, moving out in the gov ops, indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Moves out. Thank you, Chairman Hurt. Uh, one last bill on our calendar today. Uh, item number 13, House Bill 2393. Chairman Lafferty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I renew my motion. <laughs> Okay, you want to explain a little bit? Oh, oh, sorry, forgot that part. Yes, thank you. Uh, SARA, or the State Authorization Reciprocity Agreement, is a nationwide agreement to allow institutions to offer online education without the need for excessive authorization fees and regulations. Tennessee joined this agreement back in 2015. The institutional fees associated with participation when the legislation was first enacted were based in large part on a fee structure established by the National Council. However, recently, that national group has increased their fees and added additional fee levels. 
In light of those changes, this legislation will do two things. Number one, the bill uncouples Tennessee's fee structure from participating institutions from that National Council fee structure. Tennessee's fees will strictly be tied to the cost of administering the program and should not be increased or modified simply because changes were made at the national level. Number two, during the original implementation, institutions were required to submit their state fees and applications for renewal annually on the date of their original application. This complicates end-of-year fiscal reconciliation. This bill will now consolidate that renewal application and fee deadline to December 1 of each year. Now I'm happy to take any questions. And we have THEC available if necessary. Okay, Kyle members, with that explanation from Chairman Lafferty, questions of him. Pretty good explanation. Any questions been called? Any objection to the question? Here and none. I was in favor of moving House Bill 2393 out of GovOps. Indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank members, you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. Great committee. A great question. Well, I think we rolled three bills for more discussion. Without objection, do we have a motion to adjourn? Adjourn.